Hebrews chapter number 3. Save on time. We're going to summarize a few verses here at the beginning of the chapter. From verse number 1 down to verse number 6. You will find that verse number 1 says, Wherefore, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Then, it says, who is, verse number 2, faithful to him that appointed him. And then, the Bible makes comparison between how Jesus was faithful just like Moses was faithful. Okay, now Moses was faithful because Moses put his faith in Almighty God. Jesus was faithful because he was God. But, then, that's the comparison that's made from verse number 2 all the way down to verse number 6. That if Moses was faithful and people looked up to him, how much more so should we look unto Jesus who is ever more faithful than Moses ever was? Right? I mean, one of his names is faithful and true. Right? How much more faithful could he be? Right? Well, then verse number 7 says, Wherefore, meaning because of what was talked about in verses 1 through 6, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now, verse number 7, you'll notice, right after that word wherefore, there's a thing called a parenthesis, right before the word as. And then, everything in parenthesis goes all the way down to verse number 11. Because at the end of verse number 11, that's the end of the parenthesis. Okay, back in the day, when I had the software to that I talk and it would type because I don't like typing and I'd rather talk anyway. I'd tell it open parens, say whatever I want, close paren. Everything, if you're a student of English or grammar, everything inside of those parentheses is not the point. Okay, that is clarification on the point. It's something to provide either more information, to provide context, to provide a little bit more information so you understand what he's getting ready to say. So when he says, wherefore, he's summarizing what happened, verses 1 through 6, so that you understand exactly what the Holy Ghost wants you to read. So really, if we take out the parentheses, verse number 7 jumps down to verse number 12. It says, wherefore, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Well, that's still very important. Wherefore, take heed. In other words, because God expected Christ to be faithful, He expects us to be Christ-like. So what does He expect from us? Faithfulness. Take heed, lest there be in you, it says in any of you, not talking to a pastor, not talking to a deacon, not talking to Sunday school teachers, not talking to piano players, in any of you, an evil art of unbelief. Well, very few times in your Bible will you find the word evil. Most of the time it's unrighteous, it's sinful, it's carnal, it's fleshly. But the word evil is a rare bird in the Bible. Well, here... The writer of Hebrews was inspired by the Holy Ghost to say, take heed in any, unless, right, take heed. Meaning, examine yourself. Meaning, search yourself out. Beg God to reveal to you, because do I have to remind you what James said? I mean, it's the book right after Hebrews. He said that, you know, heart's deceitfully wicked. No man can know it. I mean, our very tongue said on fire of hell, the book of James tells us. No man can know his own heart. No man can know his own soul the way that God knows it. So take heed, meaning it's apt to happen to any of us. But just because your heart is evil does not mean that it is stronger than you are. 
Doesn't Revelation chapter number 1 say that he made us kings and priests, kings to rule and reign over this flesh? This body, well, guess what your heart is a part of? This body. And greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Christ is more than able to empower you to be able to overcome that deceptive, that evil, that wicked heart that is within you. But when he says, take heed, lest there be in any of you an evil heart, you know what makes your heart evil? Unbelief. You've got a wicked heart. It's deceitfully wicked, as the verse says. Meaning just when you think you've got it figured out, it's still got a few tricks up its sleeve. But deceitfully and wicked are not evil. Someone that's deceitful can be converted into somebody that tells the truth. Somebody that's wicked can be converted and turned into righteousness. But something that's evil is something that's hell-bent on staying the way that it is. Evil has a lack of remorse. There is no repentance from someone that is evil. I find that the wicked come to Christ and they're made saints. I find those that were deceitful come to Christ and then you find where the Bible tells us that let no corrupt, corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Not just deceitful, any corrupt communication. You find that the words of their flesh have been replaced with the words of the Lord. But see, someone who's evil, it brings to mind that verse that says, those that after a certain point, they live out in sin, what happens? The Lord turns them over to a reprobate mind. In the book of Revelation, it talks about those that have heard the gospel prior to the church being raptured out, that their conscience will be seared as with a hot iron. Well, if you sear a piece of meat, it means nothing can get in and nothing can get out. That's why you sear the meat at the beginning when you're grilling it. A piece of steak so that all the juice stay in the steak, doesn't get out of the steak. But once you sear it, you can't marinate it no more either. Nothing in, nothing out. You're stuck with what you got. But an evil heart of unbelief is one that is seared against the things of God. If your heart has purposed that there's a part of it, where you've let unbelief take root and then grow, your whole heart can't be given to God. There has to be a miraculous work that is done in order to take out that unbelief. As long as there's unbelief there, God can't do nothing with it. Because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. How important is it that we don't have unbelief in our heart? Well, verse number 12, it says that if in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God unbelief will cause you to leave everything that you know about God everything that God's given you everything in the blessings of God the favor of God the protection and the hedge of God you'll forsake it all like that prodigal son why did the prodigal son leave the father's house because he didn't believe that he needed to be there he believed that he needed to be in a far country and he believed that he needed to have his inheritance. Which if he studied it out, he wasn't even entitled to. But, that why was Samson down at the house of Delilah? Because he believed he needed to be there. He wanted it so bad, he convinced himself he needed to be there. Why was David in Jerusalem, in the temple, to where he was in a position to behold Bathsheba bathing in the middle of the day. Because he wasn't where he was supposed to be down at the, or at the battle of the kings, down in the valley. He wasn't with the army, he was back home. Why? Because he convinced himself and he believed that he needed to be back at the palace. Then once he saw her, what did he believe? That he needed to have her. At what cost? Any cost. The cost of the life of one of his mighty men of valor, one of the great three, Uriah the Hittite. One who so many times had pledged his life to David, meaning that because you follow God, I'll follow you, whatever the cost. But David believed that that meant that his life was his to take. No, his life was in God's hands, not David's hands. 
So why did all the people of Israel have to die as a result of David's sin? Because he believed he needed to be at the palace one day when he shouldn't have been. Belief and unbelief, very simple thing, but it's very monumental thing in your life. If you believe that you need to be somewhere, you'll be there regardless of the circumstances. If you believe that you need to do something, you'll do it no matter the cost, no matter how long it takes, no matter what you look like on the other side, you're going to look back and say it was worth it because you believe it. But if you don't believe it, it doesn't matter how much preaching, doesn't matter how much self-help books, doesn't matter how much coaching that you get or you may pay for, it doesn't matter how much time you spend devoted to trying to learn something, if you don't believe it, it's not going to take root. But I believe that's why, who was it, Penn and Teller? The one, I can't remember which one his last name is. Penn Gillette, that's his name. Penn Gillette said that the reason that he has a hard time believing that there's anything to Christianity was he said, if people really believed it, why isn't every Christian out on the street corner telling people that if they don't get saved, they're going to die and go to hell? There's a lot of truth to that. Now, I understand, as a student of the Bible, that you, you can't just go witness to somebody and expect there to be a result. God has to open the door. But there is truth to the fact, if you believe Jesus is coming back and people don't have time, why aren't you doing more? Truth is, because either you believe it or you don't. Are you here today because you believe that you need to be in the house of God to offer up praise and worship unto God because this is the time that the Lord set aside? for us to come into his house and to worship or are you here because it's part of the routine either you believe it or you don't believe it when you go to the job do you do all things as unto the Lord because you believe that God gave you that job for a reason and you ought to be the best employee or the best worker that you can be or do you just do what everybody else does whatever the world finds acceptable because either you believe it or you don't believe it See, here's the danger of having unbelief in your heart, an evil heart of unbelief. Go back to number verse number 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice. That is just as true the day that it was written as it is today. You know what the Holy Ghost is always trying to get people to do? Believe God more. Lord, I believe, but help mine unbelief. The Holy Ghost is trying to help your unbelief. So that you trust them more today, you have more faith today, you have more hope today than you did yesterday. He says, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the day of provocation. Before you can ever have unbelief, you have to have a hard heart. What causes a heart to be hardened? Sometimes it's pain. Some people get hurt, and as a result, they get calloused. I, I'll tell you a story. I got a new screen protector for my phone, and that sucker's made out of tempered glass, and now I have a cut on my finger. Okay? And I found out yesterday, because I had to work yesterday, that that part of my finger is the exact part of that finger that I used to type with on a keyboard. So every time I hit it, that sucker stung like nobody's business. Okay, now that one's not too bad, but I've had other ones that either playing football or most of the time me be, you know, doing something dumb and not paying attention to what I was doing. As a result, I got a bigger one. And even though it's gone, there's a scar there. That scar's not as soft as the skin that used to be there. But I had surgery on my back. Guess what? I can't see it, but they tell me there's scar tissue in there. The body healed. That's what if you've got a scar that means that you healed it's gone it's not part of you no more but if you're not careful right scar tissue or those scars if you never use those muscles or if you never use that skin again then it not only becomes a scar, it becomes a callus right the dangerous part of scar tissue is that if you leave it alone it starts to solidify and then it's harder to use those things that are connected to it than it used to be. 
Now, back in the day, I was give it, give it. I used to be able to squat like 375 pounds or something like that. Then I threw my back out. Then we didn't squat no more. How much can you squat now? Not much. Part of that's because them discs in there, right, they, they caused a lot of havoc. Okay, but even today, surgery took care of the disc. Took care of all the things pushing up against nerves. But I don't even have to squat. If I lean too far forward when I'm sitting down, those muscles hit the end of their stretch point. And they say, well, you can't go farther than that. Well, I don't have no pain anymore. I can get, if I wanted to, I could jump. Right? I can bend down. I can pick stuff up. But there's a point where I know mm, we can't go past this. But see, spiritually, you don't have to live that way. Those are the limitations of this flesh, this body. But spiritually, you don't have to have those calluses. You don't have to have that scar tissue. There will be a scar there to remind you of what had happened, but all the things that come with the scar, there's a balm of Gilead that the great physician can apply that will take care of that. Right? God can take those things where once you were hesitant to do it, by faith you'll step out and you find you can still care just as much as you did before. Even though you got hurt, you can get over the fact that that pain... Right? The worst pain isn't physical, it's mental. It's emotional. If you give it to God, you get over and you start exercising those spiritual muscles again, you'll find they work just as good as before. But the dangerous thing is that the world and the devil will tell you that if you start using those, you're going to get hurt again. Well, that may be true, but the person that I find that's been persecuted the most, hurt the most, that the world threw everything at him that they could trying to prove that he wasn't God was Jesus. And he overcame it all, not for himself, but for us. He was tempted in all points like we are, yet was he without sin. And then, if you read, I believe it's chapter number 2. Yeah, chapter number 2, verse number 18. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Because he proved to you through his life in those 33 and a half some years of his earthly ministry, or about three and a half years of his earthly ministry, 33 and a half years of his total life. If you look at everything that he overcame, it was for your proof that when he said, Come unto me, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. That you can trust that not only he can handle it, but he can help you overcome it. He's able to succor them that are tempted. He's able to help those that have been wounded. Why? Because he was wounded far worse than any of us can under, understand or imagine. He had to break fellowship with the Father in order to pay for our sin debt. He knows what it's like to be totally alone in this world, in this universe, in existence. And then he did that so that he could promise you that he'd never leave you nor forsake you. Right? Sometimes people get a hard heart because they're bitter. Bitterness is weird, weird sucker. Bitterness will not only cause you to right, be miserable, because bitter people can't find satisfaction anywhere, but bitterness will cause you to look at everything else in the world and convince yourself that all that they have is empty, it's vanity as the book of Ecclesiastes would say. You know what Solomon found out in the book of Ecclesiastes? He said, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. You know why he said, he wasn't talking about all things in the world, he was talking about all the works of man. Everything that man does, it's empty. There's no permanence to it. There's no eternal, everlasting ramifications for it. You know what he came to the conclusion of? The only thing that's going to last is what God does. In fact, verse number 4, chapter number 3, For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. You can put your faith in the works of man's hands, but they're using the materials that God made in the first place. He made all things. But see, bitterness will not only convince you that people can't help you, bitterness will convince you that God can't help you. You get a hard heart, because you're bitter, eventually it's going to lead to unbelief. God can't help me where I'm at. Hogwash. They promised. 
not just for salvation. If any man come unto me, I'll no wise cast him out. Why would God receive someone that he couldn't help? Me made all things. You think that he can't fix what's wrong with you? He made man. And when he made him, man was perfect. Man's the reason that man's no longer perfect. And the Creator from the beginning knew, well, when man sins, his soul's going to become dead. So before he ever made man, he made a plan to fix man's problem that man was going to cause. Of course he can help you today. But bitterness will tell you to, ah, no use in it. Bitterness will tell you that even if you go back, you won't have what you, won't have what you used to have. Even if that's true. It'll be better than where you're at right now. But it's not true. We already mentioned the prodigal son. What happened when he came back home? The father fell on him so that they couldn't stone him. Then he put a robe on him, put a ring on his finger. They slayed the best calf, or the fatted calf. He gave him the best robe. What did he do? He restored him to his former place. It wasn't about where he had been. It was the fact that he came back home. And he was still just as much a son then as he was when he left. But bitterness will tell you that it's not worth your time and you're not worth God's effort. And that hard heart would lead to unbelief. Some people got a hard heart because they blew it. They messed up and they can't get over the fact that they messed up. And because they messed up, their heart's gotten so hard because they're so hard on themselves. They're so critical of themselves that they can't look past themselves and see that the arm of flesh is going to fail you. Right? But I'm trusting in the arm of the Savior. Where is He seated? At the right hand of the Father in heaven. The right hand is always a symbol of power. What's that mean? All power has been given unto Christ. You can't, but He can't. We just sang that song. Right? He's the master of everything. Not just the oceans and the seas. Beasts, spirits, carnal flesh. He's in charge of it all. But how do you know that, Brother Jordan? Because one of these days over in the book of Revelation, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he's Lord of Lord and King of Kings. You know what they're saying? That he has all power. It's already true. They just don't want to admit it. Why? Because they got an evil heart of unbelief. But we don't have time to get into all the reasons why people can have a hard heart. But a hard heart, what's it lead to? Unbelief. Why did Pharaoh not believe that God was intent on his people being let go out of Egypt? Because he didn't believe. And what do you find after that tenth plague that came to Egypt? It says that God broke his heart. He finally got past how hard-hearted Pharaoh was, and then Pharaoh eventually had to admit, your God's the God. And even though he agreed to do what God said, what do you find just a few verses later? Here he comes chasing after him on chariots. It was so hard that even after God had proven, I mean, we heard it last Sunday, but all those plagues were sent to what? Show that their gods had no power, but Jehovah God had all power. Well, even after being thoroughly proven wrong, what's he do? He still doesn't believe God after his firstborn has been taken from him because he was too hard-hearted to agree to what God wanted. What happens? He still decides to be enemies with God. But that's how powerful unbelief is. But he says, Heart not your heart is in the day of provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works for 40 years. Keep in mind, the book of Hebrews was written to the lost people of Israel the Hebrews but we can look back through the schoolmaster of the Old Testament right those given to us as end samples that we can learn from their lives those 40 years in the wilderness why do you think that so often preachers use that as an example the fact that if God can take care of them for 40 years he can take care of you because of their hard hearts they tempted and they proved God well what did they prove that he was everything that he said he was that he was able to take care of all their needs just like he said he would. That he was stronger than any enemy that they were going to face. And he was. That as long as they trusted him, they were going to enter into 
His land of rest, Canaan land, the promised land. Not well. It says, wherefore I was grieved with that generation. There were consequences to their hard-heartedness. Right, in fact, what does so many times you'll find it illustrated that, that they were hard-hearted, that they were uncircumcised of heart, get stiff-necked. What are all of those indicative of? Pride. Any of us are apt to have a hard heart. But you know what will keep a hard heart? Pride. Not wanting to admit that you were wrong. Not wanting to admit that maybe you're not as smart as you thought you were. Maybe. Right, pride. I mean, we know for a fact that pride was the reason that that generation that came out of Egypt, they had to die off. Why did they have to die off? Because... They didn't believe. What happened when Moses came down off the mountain with those original tablets of Ten Commandments? They had already made themselves another god. They would started up a feast where they were doing a whole bunch of wickedness just like the place that they had just come from. And it wasn't because they didn't believe that God had power. They believed that God had power and believed that they didn't want Him. They said, we will not have Him as our God. Go study it out. They wanted a God that they could control. They wanted a golden calf that they could make the rules on what makes that happy and what makes it angry and what they can live and still be right with the golden calf. They didn't want the God that when he's, you know, he didn't even step foot on the mountain. He just overshadowed the mountain and the whole thing started shaking. There's lightnings and earthquakes and a dark cloud that they couldn't see what was going on on the top. His very finger had come down and carved into stone the first, you know, the first ten laws that God said, this is how my people are going to live. And they didn't want anything to do with them. In fact, God wanted to wipe them off the map and start over again with Moses, and Moses begged him not to. And then Moses came down, and then he wanted to kill them. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? Pride will cause you to throw everything that God has in store for you right out the window. And you'll convince yourself that that's what you need. You need something less than what God intended for you. Well, if that were the case, then God wouldn't have offered all that God offers to you. You know what God offered you? Everything that you need to live a victorious Christian life for Him. You know what's less than that? You're not living a victorious Christian life. Anything less than what God intended, you're living far below your privileges as a child of God. But you're also inviting hardship, and you're inviting pain, and you're inviting a lot of misery into your life because you don't want to accept what God said you needed. Well, it says so, it says, wherefore I was grieved with that generation. Their hard-heartedness, their uncircumcised of heart, what's that? They didn't want to exercise that faith. They wanted to continue on in their unbelief. So, as a result of that, he was grieved with them and said, They do always err, or I'm sorry, always err in their heart. You know what your heart controls? If you let it run free reign, your heart will control everything. It is the way of carnal man that you chase after what's in your heart. Show me a sin, and I'll show you that it boils down to one of three things. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, or the pride of life. You know what all that has to do with? In your heart, you said, I've seen it and I want it. I want to know what that feels like. Or, I want it because I want it. Pride of life. I want it because I'm in control. I get to decide what I get to do. You know where all that starts? I want, I need, I desire, down here. Because you know what those words are? If you want something, that's an emotion. 
You convince yourself that you need something, but I find that having food and raiment to be content therewith. You don't need everything that the world has, to, but you'll convince yourself that you do. Why? Because you want it. The pride of life, you want to do it. Regardless of what it is, you just want it. It all boils down to that you want it more than you don't want it. Because if you didn't want it, you wouldn't be chasing after it. All of it has to stem from the heart, but a Christian doesn't live with your heart. A Christian lives from the soul. That part of you that used to be dead. Why does the world live with their heart? Because their soul's dead. Dead in trespasses and sin. It can't do anything for them. But your soul's been made alive. In fact, it's been made to join there with Jesus. It's already got your name recorded in heaven. Your conversation's recorded there. In order to live as a victorious Christian, you need to use your soul, the fruits of the Spirit, where those born, and your spirit. It is the Spirit that leads and guides us, talking about the Holy Spirit, into all truths. Well, how do you follow? Through the Spirit. How are we supposed to worship? In spirit and in truth. The Christian has to use the Spirit in order to live a victorious Christian life. But too many Christians revert back to living with their heart. But if you live with the Spirit, you're going to want the things of God in your heart. You're going to crave the things of God in your heart. But you're not letting your heart make the decisions. Your Spirit is guiding the rest of your body. Well, why did they always err in their heart? Because their heart's deceitfully wicked. We've already covered that. They chased after the heart, and you find that in Noah's day, every thought was evil continually. All their desires, everything that they chased after, after all of it was evil. And it said that in the last days, it'll be as in the days of... Why? Because people just been chasing after their heart. Nobody's been able to stand in the hedge, make up the gap, and say, no, we don't need to chase after everything. That we, what we need is what God said. Why is the world getting worse and worse? Because there's fewer and fewer people every year. Why? Because they've started living after their heart again. And in their heart, they do always err. Because the heart is after this world. The heart is going back to this world. It's part of that flesh. It's cursed with sin. It didn't get saved. So what's it desire? The things of the old man. And that's all that it'll pursue if you give your heart free reign in your life. And it says, they do always there in the heart, and they have not known my ways. Why didn't they want God? Because they wanted to live the way that they wanted to live. Well, why didn't they become acquainted with His ways? They didn't care what God was telling Moses up on top of the mountain. They didn't care about any of the instruction that God continued to give Moses for the people of Israel. They didn't want to know, so they didn't know. See, if you've got an evil heart of unbelief, you don't believe that this is the absolute and final authority of your life. You don't believe that in this, it's everything that you need. I, be, I mean, granted, we're people. God knew that we were people. God knew that people make mistakes. God knew that a church, right, a called out collection of blood bought believers to have a place to come out and worship. He knew that people were going to make mistakes, and he knew that he'd need an under shepherd. But in an ideal world, we wouldn't need pastors. In an ideal world, you wouldn't need Sunday school teachers. Show me where Adam and Eve had a pastor. Show me where they had to go to Sunday school. Before they sinned, they were exactly the way God intended them to be and what they have. They had fellowship. They didn't need a book, but He promised everything you needed was in here. If we were all good enough students of the Bible to get in here and figure out what we needed on our own, when we came to church, all we'd do is worship. If we all got in here and did our responsibility, we wouldn't have to hear them rough messages that nobody likes to hear. 
But why does God have to send them? Because it's what you need to hear. And God wants the best for you. But see, they did not know His ways because all they wanted was their ways. Well, those that sought the way of the Lord found it out and became, knew it, lived it. Who's our example? Moses. Pretty good example. What about after him? Joshua. Pretty good example. Right? Caleb, the only other spy that was sent in that said, God's able to whoop them all. He lived it. As a result, Joshua and Caleb, they got to see the promised land. What happened to them other ten spies? Their unbelief kept them from seeing the promised land. Those that knew it, they've proved it time and time again. Throughout all of history since Christ, you know what the, the testimony of the church has been? If you live the way that God says to live, it's going to be okay. Always works. Doesn't go wrong. Right? The world can throw whatever it is at you, but unless God says that it can touch you, it ain't even going to hit you. And if God does say that it can hit you, He's equipped you to handle it. You know what the root of every testimony when somebody gets up and says, I want to praise God, you know what they're really saying? God did what He said He would. God promised and He did it. There's so much available in here in the testimony of people's lives we're without excuse not to believe God so why do people still not believe God it's because they got a hard heart it's because of pride and what's it going to cost them well verse number 11 so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest you know why Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years and not 4 days because they had to wait for those that didn't believe to die off. If all would have believed, they'd have been in Canaan land a whole lot sooner. I wonder how many things in our lives today we're still wrestling with, we're still wandering around in the wilderness. We say, well, we don't have the blessings that we expect to have, we don't have the fruit in our life that we expect to have, we don't have this, we don't have that. When I pray, I feel like it don't get higher than the ceiling. All these things that I've been asking God for, none of them come to fruition. Well, how about you try believing God and see how quick you get out of the wilderness? Because see, when he says, Wherefore, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. When he's saying, Wherefore, He's saying, because of all the examples that we've got of people that didn't and it didn't work out, the example that he chooses to use in those parentheses right, is the Hebrews in the wilderness. What did God want for all of those people? Well, they had been crying out for hundreds of years that God would turn their captivity. And God purposed to do it. And he intended to take them from captivity to Canaan. What was Canaan? It was a land flowing with milk and honey. The land so prosperous that when they brought back a bushel of grapes, they had to hang it on a stick and carry it between two of them. I ain't never seen grapes that big. You never have either. They go down into Canaan, what God want to give them? All that He promised to Abraham. You study it out, it's a whole lot bigger than what they got nowadays too. It went from the Nile all the way to the Euphrates. Where's that? From Egypt all the way to Iraq. And then they had up and down too. Go study the boundaries. God gave them a whole big chunk of land. What'd they do to earn it? Nothing. But why'd they get it? Because God promised that He'd give it to them. Why did they get to reap all of those benefits? Because God said that they did. What did God intend for them to have? A blessed, a peaceful and a prosperous existence. But what did they end up getting? They got manna and quail for 40 years. Granted, none of their clothes wore out. They were still toting behind them all the riches of Egypt. They just couldn't do nothing with them. They had all the, land, uh, you know, all the livestock and everything, but they had no land to put them to pasture. 
Instead of living in a house, they had to live with the animals. They lived in tents. Whenever they moved, they had to pick up everything that they owned and take it with them. You ever meet somebody that it feels like they... Well, some people I do believe. No offense, ladies. Most of the time it's y'all. They go and say, well, hang on. Let's pack up and we'll leave. And then they put half the house in their purse. Right? Well, you never know if you're going to need it. If I need it, God will make a way for me to get it. It'll be okay. Right? Leave the lamp. Don't put the lamp in your purse. Okay? My phone's got a flashlight. We'll be good. Right? But some people, you get to talking with them, and it feels like everything that they got, they're carrying it on their shoulders. They're under the pressure of what God's blessing. If God gave it to you, God's well able to keep it. See, the key is, is that if God gives you something, is turn around and give it right back to him. Lord, thank you for this. But Lord, you gave it to me. It's yours. Do whatever you want with it. What are we going to do with them crowns that we get one of these days in glory? We're going to cast them at his feet. Why? Because they're not ours. Everything that he gave me, he just let me borrow for a little while. The key is that none of it's on my show. It's all in his hands. You want a victorious life? Unburden yourself from everything that you... That's what God intends for you. He wants you to go to Canaan land. You can have a house. You can put your stuff there. You don't need to take it with you. God's going to take care of it. Right? All those livestock that He's given you, all those blessings that just keep multiplying, and everything, He's got those too. He's already got a grass that they can eat, field where they can live. It's going to be fine. He'll take care of it. But what's our purpose as a Christian? It's not to be consumed with the mundane things of the world. No, ours is a calling that we're supposed to go and tell the world. You're not going to tell if you believe that you need to be caught up in all the stuff going on in your life. I know the master of the seas. If the winds and waves obey his voice, how much more will everything in my life? He said, let there, and then everything came into existence. He didn't even use his hands until he made man. He just said it and it happened. You don't think he's able to take care of everything in your life? Well, those Israelites in the wilderness, they had to be consumed with all the things that they were carrying around. That was their problem. They were focused down here with their hearts. They weren't looking spiritually to him. Let us look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Why? Because he's got it all in control. When you realize how much he's got it in control, it don't bother you no more. Oh, you still feel, you still love, you still care about people, but you're not carrying them around on your shoulders. You've got faith that God's going to take care of it. And you're more concerned with, what does God want me to do today? Do you know what Israel got to do once they got to Canaan? All they had to be concerned with was what God wanted them to do. As long as they did what God said, everything was fine. But as a Christian, you know what God tells you to do today? Trust Him with all the other stuff. God can handle your bank account. God can handle your retirement. God can handle your family. God can handle your kids. God can handle everything in your life. Or you can try and handle it. But you want to know why you'll try to handle it? Because you don't believe God can. And if you don't believe that God can't in this way, it's not much more of a step before you start believing God can't help here and here and here and here and then eventually you get an evil heart of unbelief which causes you to do what? Verse number 12 departing from the living God you want know, you to know why people get backslid? because they stop believing God you don't know why God turns some over to the destruction of flesh so that the soul might be saved? because they stop believing God you want to know why some people are living victoriously and others aren't? Because some believe God and some don't. Belief is the mechanism and faith is that thing that God gave you because He gave unto every man a measure of faith so that you could be unbound by the world. He came to break the chains of sin, break the binds of this carnal flesh and to elevate you to something better to where you can live victoriously in spirit and in truth. But if you don't believe them, what are you stuck with? 
You're going back to them chains and the things that bind you and keep you bound, keep you miserable. So just believe God. It takes effort. It's not just going to happen overnight. But believe Him in everything. The songwriter said it best, trust and obey, for there's no other way. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.